Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to open your word, that you would open our hearts, that we would hear from your word, that we would allow it to change our lives. Are there any that don't know the good news of Jesus Christ, that today they would come to know Christ as their Savior. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. I love a good storyline of, uh, of uh, a book, a movie, and what typically for me makes it is a plot twist that has been right in front of me the entire time, and I just didn't see it. Are you that way as well? Uh, I think those are the type that most people like. And today, we come to what is the greatest plot twist in the life of all mankind, but it isn't a story. It's real life. Right in front of our eyes, and right in front of the eyes of the greatest scholars, the greatest prophets for centuries who were yearning for the Messiah to come, to free them physically, comes Jesus Christ. But he doesn't free them physically or militarily. Instead, he does something that is far greater, something that I guess they didn't even realize they needed as much. The Lord Jesus Christ comes and he frees mankind spiritually for eternity. Faith in the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection for our sin. It changes not just our day-to-day life, it changes our eternal destiny. And has been sung about in each of the songs that we've sung this morning. For the past six weeks, we've been discussing God's eternal plan. In week two, we saw man's corruption. The corruption of God's creation with the sin that they had done, Adam and Eve. And the big assumption there is that we, mankind, had marred God's plan. But that's not true. That's a false assumption. Yes, we marred his creation, but God is sovereign and God is omniscient. And his plan foresaw what his creation, you and I, would do. He foresaw that we would sin. And his plan, he planned accordingly, knowing that. And even more amazing is that he created us anyway, knowing that we would sin. So let us look today at the the major ideas that God the Son, Jesus Christ, We're going to see he lived, he died, he arose, and he ascended. In Philippians chapter 2, i got to turn there myself still. Philippians chapter 2, we read starting in verse 6, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I want us to first see today, Jesus Christ lived. You say, well, that's pretty simple. We know that. Yes, I know we know that. This is God's eternal plan, the the seven seas of history that we're going through. And these are basic components. These are the foundational stones that we need to know in our life. And, And with this, as we talk about the cross today, is first to know Jesus Christ lived. John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And as we shared last week, after centuries of man given the law of God, mankind knew that it was impossible. It was impossible for us as sinful man to live up to the standard of the law. And all of us are sinful. All of us are in this situation to keep God's righteousness, to keep His perfect standard. So what does God do? God the Father didn't just send a deliverer, like we see in the book of Judges. God didn't just send a warrior, like we see King David. God didn't just send a prophet, like we see in the major and minor prophets of Israel. He sent God the Son, His only begotten Son. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. 
Jesus Christ, 100% God and 100% man. Put your mind around that. I can't explain it, but I can accept that by faith. And God's eternal plan requires, we see, that the Godhead come to earth. And we look at this, and I think there are two reasons, probably many more, but we'll mention two. It says there, and we beheld his glory. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The first reason we see here is that man was able to physically see God, his glory. We got to see it. Man was able to see how a perfect man lived. You might think your father is the, was the perfect man, but something came up in one point in your life when you realized, no, dad's not. No, mom's not. Or you realized in your own life, at least I hope you have, no, I'm not perfect either, right? But now with God coming to earth, we see the perfect man living. We saw how a perfect man reacted to things, how the perfect man cared for others. We see how he cared for those he loved. Those that were mistreated. We see how he cared for those that were outcasts. How those that are in leadership. We see how he treated all of those. We see how he treated injustices in the world. And how the perfect man eventually dealt with rejection. Isaiah tells us, before centuries before Jesus is, comes to earth, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. The glory of God for 33 years was on full display, showing mankind how we are to live, but realizing in this fallen world that we cannot. So he first came to show how to live. And I think secondly, we see he became... And he came as a servant. Our text for today in Philippians 2, 6, and 8, the last part of that says, but he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion of men, what did he do? He humbled himself. Jesus didn't just come as the perfect man. He also came as a humble servant and he lived that way. He came as the opposite of everything the people thought and assumed would be of the Messiah. He uses the words humble and servant, fashion of man. The strength of eternal God submitting to the weakness of the flesh that you and I have and doing it perfectly. It is in this that we can know that we can come to him. It is because he was fashioned that way that you and I know that we can easily come to the Lord in prayer, fully knowing that he has experienced the pain that you have today. The sorrow that some of you have in your life today. He understands it. The person next to you might not understand it. The people that you hang out with every day might not understand it, but the Lord does. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our Lord lived. We see as we finish that verse, Philippians 2.8, we see also that Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ died. And being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now this is the plot twist. This is the plot twist that they did not think about. It's not so much a plot twist because the Messiah was killed, although... The prophets did not see that, and they didn't understand that. It's the plot twist when we read the rest of the Bible that this was part of God's eternal plan. That's the plot twist. 
From the beginning, we see that this was part of God's eternal plan. That blows my mind. That God would still be willing to go through with this. But with his love toward us, this is the plan that he had. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20 tells us, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by the traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, how long? Who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest or shown in these last times to you. This was God's eternal plan. Revelation, he says it again, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship thee, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is one of many that we could share. This was God's plan. These references clearly tell us that in God's omniscience, he looked through time and before his creation, he already knew that you and I would sin. He knew that Adam and Eve would sin. He also knew that in our sin, that we have no means of salvation. We have no means within ourselves to remedy our lost state. No way to remedy your lost state today. And because we are dead in our sin, dead men cannot save themselves. It is impossible for us to do that. And with that, our Lord and Savior came and it says the cross, the very thing that is despised and rejected, was foreordained. God knew His task. Jesus Christ knew His task when He started and when He took part in the creation of this world. He already knew what he would face. Jesus knew his task when he walked in the, in the, the, the morning as, and he walked in the evening in the garden with Adam and Eve. He knew they would fail. And he knew what was going to become of him. And he definitely knew when he came to earth for those 33 years what was going to happen. Notice in, verse, in the verses in Philippians 2 there that it tells us that Jesus became obedient Jesus became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This obedience is ever so evident as we we watch Jesus Christ and in his last days as he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he is praying there and he says, not my will but thine be done. Completely surrendered to the obedience, fully submitted to God's plan, God the Father's plan. And God's plan to redeem the pinnacle of His creation, mankind, was for His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross in our place. John the Baptist, when he sees Him, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Clearly known. And so it was, Jesus, after living the perfect life, when he was denied, when he was rejected by his own creation. John tells us he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The only means of salvation for anyone that is here, for anyone that is listening today, is through Jesus Christ. He is the way. The only way. And that salvation is because of Jesus Christ living and Jesus Christ died, but also because Jesus Christ arose. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. For he hath put all things under his feet. That's that opening phrase. But now is Christ risen from the dead. There is great significance for Jesus Christ's death on the cross. But even more so is his resurrection. No man has ever done that before. There are many people that have died for a cause or for someone else. And I'm not diminishing Jesus Christ's ultimate sacrifice for us by taking upon him. But many people have died for the sake of others. Now I would say, none of them when they died was the sun blotted out for a period of time. Was the veil torn in the temple? Were dead people raised from the grave during that time? That's a little different, is it not? 
But the miraculous and the supernatural is that Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus arose. And Jesus Christ, when he did that, he conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. He is the one and only sacrifice. And when we look at the cross, Jesus is no longer there. I was just in different cities and we went into temples and we went into basilicas and on the cross every time was the suffering Savior, Jesus Christ. He is no longer there. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. It is just the symbol of what Jesus Christ did for us. He is risen. It tells us in Hebrews 9.26, he says, for Christ is not entered into the holy place made by with hands, which are the figures of the true, but it into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. He doesn't offer himself over and over again as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he ha- often have suffered since the foundation of the world over and over. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, so Christ, say it with me, once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. It is through Jesus Christ's resurrection that mankind, you and I, can be reborn, resurrected. Salvation occurs at the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. When you place your faith, not us as a church, not you as a family, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died and rose again. Now, he did that 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ did that 2,000 years ago, and God knew your need for redemption before you were even thought of by your parents. It is the gift of salvation, and it has been waiting there for each and every one of us our entire life. But it's not yours until you reach out and take it. Every gift that you've ever been given in your life, until you reached out and took that gift, it is not yours. Now, Jesus died 2,000 years ago and was resurrected on the third day. That is the gift of God to you. Have you taken that gift? Have you done that today? It's important. In fact, it is the most important decision you will make in your entire life. And I encourage you today to reach out and take that. There's without a doubt someone here today someone that's been watching online or will watch this later, and you've never taken that gift of salvation. Make it today. Maybe you've never acknowledged that you're a sinner. Or maybe you've never realized that your sin was so severe that it has caused you to be separated from God for eternity. When we are separated from God for eternity, that means we are spiritually dead, and we will spend our eternity in hell. The lake of fire separated from God. But friend, you need to realize that God loves you. He loves you so much that all of this came about. All of this plan was put in place. That God loved you, that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in your place. And that is the most precious gift that God could possibly give you. Don't reject so great a gift. Don't reject the gift of salvation. Because it is nothing more critical. No more critical decision that you will make in your life. Do it today, please. We'll have a time of invitation, and I encourage you to come and speak to one of our altar workers. Or you can just pray right now and ask the Lord to save you. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. Call out to him, realizing that you were a sinner, believing that Jesus died in your place, and just ask him to come and save you. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise, and God will do that. Now, Christians, don't put your Bibles up yet. I have one more point. All right? (laughs) Jesus Christ lived. He died. He arose. And what's next? No, and not coming back yet. We got to get him somewhere else first, right? He ascended. All right? Jesus Christ ascended. Now, for us as Christians, this this last aspect is very important for us. 
All right? Because this is how we live our life. There are many aspects that are very important, but due, uh, due to the time, we're just going to mention two about Jesus' ascension here. The first is this, that Jesus Christ's ascension means that he advocates for us. Your Lord advocates for you. Think about that. Jesus is no longer on the cross. He is, tells us he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And in that position, he advocates for you. First John, John says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate. Who? With the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. That's the one advocating for us. First Timothy 2, he says, For there is one God and one mediator. Underline that. One mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There is no need to be praying to patron saints of anything. All right? And I'm not mocking a person that has grown up that way, hearing that their entire life. That is not found in the Word of God. We do not pray to patron saints because we have one mediator. Who wants, who wants some secondary person when we can pray directly through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Amen. We don't pray to the Lord's mother, Mary, either. That is not found in Scripture. God the Son is seated in the heavens next to His Father, and He speaks to Him on our behalf. While He was here on earth, He spoke on our behalf. You see in his priestly prayer in John 17, he is praying for those that had been given to him, and he continues to do so today. Along with that, being our advocate, excuse me, <coughs> he is also our high priest. No longer do we need an earthly priest here that represents God to us and us to God. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ represents us more than, in, more than just being an advocate. We can pour out, as I mentioned before, we can pour out our heart to Him. We can pour out our needs to Him. We can pour out our hurts to Him because as we read in Hebrews 14, 15, He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Let us come therefore boldly. Are you doing that? Are you coming boldly to the Lord? Or are you just keeping it to yourself? It's one of the most glorious attributes of being a Christian is that we have this time where we can spend with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and He will give us mercy and He will give us grace. Do you need that today? I can guarantee there's someone in here that needs that today. And if not now, you will sometime soon. And it's the Christ bodily and physical connection with mankind that He feels our infirmities. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our needs and our hurts. And Christian, are you holding on to something that you're unwilling to give to the Lord, unwilling to allow the Lord to help you with today? I don't know what it is. We all put a pretty good face on on Sunday. Allow the Lord to speak to you. It could be a struggle at school. It could be a situation there's a hurt going on in your home, a pain with your spouse that you feel like you can't share with anyone else. It could be a health problem that's out of your hands. You don't know what to do with it. Pour it out to the Lord. The salvation of a child, a friend, a spouse. For years and years you've been praying. Turn it to the Lord. There's a person that has an addiction. No one else knows about it. You need to pour it out to the Lord. He knows he can obtain the mercy and grace that you need. Jesus Christ is here. He has ascended. He is there to listen and to help. He gives us, when he departed from this world, he left us the Holy Spirit that indwells in us. He comforts. He convicts. And with that, we know we can turn to the Lord. I encourage you not to push the Lord away. You were not meant to do this on your own. I know that's contrary to what America says. We were not to meant to do this on our own. That's why the Lord came. And Christians, we need to take advantage of that. We need to acknowledge our Lord, and we need to let him guide our steps. Are you doing that? Or is it all on your own? You can be John Wayne if you want. That's not the way to live life. Turn to the Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ lived. 
Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ arose. and Thank the Lord he ascended as well. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to this time of invitation, I ask you to burden the hearts of those that are Christians here today that they would turn to you, that they would boldly come to your throne to help them in their time of need, to find that mercy and grace that you have promised, that you will guide us as we acknowledge you and that you would guide our steps and show us the path you have for our life. Dear Heavenly Father, there are without a doubt someone here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And may they realize what you did by sending your son. How he died in our place. And that if we, if a person will just place their trust in him, they will be saved. Dear Heavenly Father, don't let us leave this place today before we make decisions to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.